<laughs> Oops. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Gwendolyn. I go by Gwen, and I'm a grateful Christian who struggles with codependency and anxiety. <laughs> Thank you. Well, look at me. I Miss America. <laughs> See, this was my childhood dream to be Miss America. My mom and I would sit in front of that TV every year to see who was going to win. And of course, I had to put on that crown and my banner, and I had to practice that Miss America wave because I really wanted to be Miss America. But my life went a different direction. In 1966, I actually, my mom was out plowing in the field, and I decided to come early. And my parents really wanted a boy, but I was a girl. And I was the only girl on my dad's side, which was great because I loved to build forts and we would go three-wheeling and I'd play kickball. So I had a really good time. But my parents still wanted a boy, so I felt like I didn't belong. And my mom would take us to mass every Sunday, of course, and we'd sit in the second pew at 7.30. And of course, um, we were taught by nuns because we had to go to CCD. And when, back then, I loved to talk. I don't like to talk very much. I'm very introverted, believe it or not. Um, I have a hard time letting go. But back then, I did like to talk. And the nuns used to take their ruler and hit me on the hand. And they would put that clothespin on my mouth when I was in kindergarten. It was not a good sight. But something happened to me in fourth grade. And what happened was, I was called upon to read, and as I was reading, I started to stutter. I couldn't get the words out. I, I couldn't even say English words. I do that now sometimes. And I was humiliated. The kids were making fun of me, and it was very tough. And so what happened was I kind of slid back, and I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't participate anymore. I didn't want to be involved. And that was the same year that I decided I wanted to twirl baton. I can twirl one, two, three batons, knives, flags, uh, rifles, you name it, I can twirl it. I have over a thousand trophies. I was a uh, U.S. Grand Champion, feature twirler of the United States. I even tried out for the Georgia Bulldogs as a feature twirler. My mom kept me busy. And uh, what I found out was as I was doing things, that that power, it gave me power because people liked to see me perform. And then what happened was when I was in middle and high school, I was in everything you can think of. I was in oboe, I played flute, I was in choir, I was in musicals, I was in plays, I was in basketball, volleyball, track, softball. My mom kept me busy. And, of course, on the weekends, we would travel all over the state of Ohio and go to baton competitions. My mom started living her life through me and started telling me what to do. But guess what? Performing gave me power, and she loved me. And that's all I wanted. Now, my dad, on the other hand, he was never around. My dad, when he came home, he worked two jobs. He would come home, and of course, he would fight with my mom. My mom and dad would fight. My dad would throw things. My mom would chase after him with a knife. It was tough. And my dad would just run off, or my, I'm sorry, my brother would run off, and he would be scared. And I would try to break them up. I wanted him to die because I didn't like him. I just wanted him to go. But, of course, that didn't happen. They decided to stay together because they felt it would be better for us. In school, I always talked to people. I was homecoming queen. I dated the quarterback. I looked like I was popular, but I felt alone. I didn't have any really close friends because, remember, my mom was my best friend. I was always traveling with her everywhere, so I didn't spend a lot of weekends with people. So I never got really close. And I did do some partying, um, but my parents didn't smoke or drink. 
And I did try marijuana once, believe it or not, and I passed out <laughs> for four hours. Never tried it again. <laughs> it wasn't for me. <laughs> my senior year in high school, one of my friends told me, do you know what your dad said? I said, what did my dad say? He said, you're going to be a loser and that you're not going to amount to anything. I thought to myself, it, it hurt because I thought my dad's never around. He's never seen me play basketball. When I was a freshman, I played varsity basketball. He never saw me twirl my baton until I was in the Miss Ohio pageant when I was 18 years old. How could he say something like that? It just hurt me. All I wanted him to do was tell me that he loved me, that I was beautiful, but he never did. And so it was very hard for me. And I made a vow that day. I said, I will never ask him for help, ever. And when I did that, I said, I'll show him. I'll be somebody. Well, this is where step three for me was very hard. <laughs> very hard. Because the first time I went through the steps, step three, I just kind of glazed through it. But when I went through the second time, I realized that I had a problem because I saw my heavenly father as I saw my earthly dad. It was hard for me to ask for help. But then I finally took my rebellion to the next level. I met a guy that was 10 years older than me in 1987. He brought me to the Lord. And he wanted to get married right away. And my mom, of course, didn't want to come to the wedding. She said, you know, that's, you're going to ruin your life. Well, I didn't listen. I thought it was because she couldn't, you know, go to pageants with me anymore. And so what happened was I had a feeling I shouldn't get married. But I didn't listen to that little gut. And he told me, if we don't get married at this time, that God won't open that window. And he started using scriptures. But... Being young, naive, I decided to move forward. And six, as, as I went on my honeymoon, I came back. I was 20 years old. I was an instant mom to a 10 and a 12-year-old. And so I had to learn to homeschool them. And then the next thing was he told me what to wear, what to do. I had to get rid of all my records, my ACD, my, you know, all my rock records I had to get rid of. I had to, get, I had to read what he wanted me to read. I had to watch TV, what he wanted me to watch. And we ended up having a daughter, and eight, nine months later, we ended up moving to Florida, 1,200 miles away from my family, friends. I had no one here. I was isolated. He told me if I would leave, he would take my daughter. He t controlled the money. My codependency, because I was just naive and I was young and, and it was just very tough. I, I just couldn't do it. And then I, we ended up having another child. And as we were going forward, we had 10 companies. Two of them got bought up by Fortune 500 companies. If you were looking at my life, looking at me, you would think, oh, she's got it all. She's got a house out in Colorado. She's got planes. She's got cars. She's got everything. But I was unhappy. I was lonely. He was leaving all the time. He was leaving me. And I had the kids. And then the third child comes. And he decides, I'm not happy anymore. And we had been married 13 years. And he said, I fell in love with one of our employees. At first, I was devastated, and I thought, what did I do? And then I was happy. It was like freedom. I was like, okay, I'm good. Everything's going good. And then the next thing I knew, as we were going through the divorce, knock on the door. It was the IRS, the SEC, the FBI. My life turned upside down. He was going away to prison for 15 years. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no family, friends. My dad couldn't help me because he had lost his job at the same time. They came and they seized everything I owned. No bed. I had $1,000 to my name. 
My seven-year-old wanted to commit suicide. I had a one in three and seven, and I knew that I had to do something. I had to get up. I had to show that don't give up. They were watching me. And I ended up starting to work three jobs, got back on my feet. I ended up meeting a, a, a guy online, which is my current husband. I met him on AOL, which there is no AOL anymore. <laughs> but we ended up getting together, and I was excited. He had three girls. I have three girls. He didn't drink. He didn't smoke. I thought, wow, this is great. Life's good. <laughs> and I'm doing good. You know, I started build, build, building our, building our businesses. I got him into the real estate world with me. I was selling two, 300 homes a year. I started getting companies. I had 10 companies. I had a title company. I was doing well. Again, everything was going great. And then he started to drink old duels. And then the next thing was beer. And then the next thing was women. That was tough. Because then what I did was I bought him a boat. Because remember, I'm codependent, right? I'm like, I want to keep him. So I buy him a boat, thinking I'm going to keep him. I, I build a house. And then things get better. We're back on again. And then he has another affair. I buy him a Corvette this time. Again, I'm codependent. I want to please him. I want to take care of him. I want him to love me. And so as that goes on, during that time that I was going through this, my mother dies. Now you got to remember, I remember she was living through me. And I started realizing I didn't know who I was. She had passed away. She was my cheerleader. She was what, she told me what to do, who to be. And it was tough, because I didn't know who I was. I was living for her. And as I was going through that, my ex-husband gets out of prison. And my youngest, at that time, when, she, when he went to prison, he, she was one. And when he got out, she was a freshman in high school. She tried to commit suicide. They did Baker act her. Because what happened was he told her that he was not their father, when he went into prison that he was no longer wanted to deal with her or any of them. And it was tough. She felt rejected. And as I was going through that, the recession hits, right? I had 10 offices. I thought I was doing okay. I took my eyes off God. I lost everything I owned again for the second time. My cars, my house. It was tough, very tough. But I knew I had to get back up again. And as I was going through all this, I was still dealing with my husband. Because remember, my mom taught me never to quit. I could never quit. I had to stay busy. And he started to go out a little bit more and started to go to strip clubs. And one night, he didn't come home. He comes home the next day, and of course, he had been out, and he went through $4,000 worth of our money. And then $400, he still owed the strip club, and I had to give him $400 the next day. I had it. I was done. As I was out running, I told God, I said, God, I'm done. I'm quitting. I give up. I'm giving it to you because I can't take this anymore. And as I was going through that, <laughs> there was a fallen star, and I knew right then and there that I gave it to God, that it was up to God to help him. And when I did those next couple weeks, he started going to AA. He started going to choose recovery, and he started changing. Now, of course, that part of me thought, oh gosh, when is he going to fall again? 
but my life was unmanageable, and that's where I had to start working a program. And that's where step one came in, because my life was unmanageable. And as I was watching him go through choose recovery, I realized I needed a place. I didn't have anywhere. I didn't have anyone to talk to. Remember, I was isolating myself all through this. I had no family, friends that I could talk to. And so as I was going through this and, and going to choose recovery, I started working the steps. I started working the program. My life was a mess. And God has been with me. So step two for me has been very easy because I have had God helping me through this. He's been my best friend. And when I worked step four, when we started working on those steps, writing it down on paper, the people that have hurt us, you know, just like we all, hopefully you guys are all working on that because I know some people, they stop because they don't want to work on it. But as you work on it, you start to forgive. You start to let go. You start to heal. And the hardest thing for me was I wasn't perfect in all this, believe me. And I am being raw tonight to share this with you because a lot of my story I have not shared with a lot of people. It's embarrassing. But I wasn't perfect. And when I listened to someone's testimony that was up here about a month and a half ago, I heard her say something that actually was something that spoke to me. See, when he was going through having all those affairs, I decided to seek out a man also. Now, it only happened to me a couple times because God said no. And I argued with God. I said, it's not fair. The first husband cheated on me. The second husband's cheated on me. What's wrong with me? But I knew it was wrong. And what happened was, as soon as she got done talking about it in her testimony, I went and talked to her. I did what we do when we confess to another, when we admit it. And that's the step that I took. It was so freeing because I had not shared that with anyone. I kept that buried inside. And as all you know, we have to go then to God because step six and seven tells us about those shortcomings, those defects that we have. And I had to bring it to God. And believe me, I was shame. I was, I was full of shame. Because what happened was Kip was putting me on this pedestal saying I never did anything. But really, I had my own issues. I had my own struggles. And so when I went to him to make amends that night, and I looked him in the eye and I said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do anything, and, and I made my amends. And it was so freeing. I said, you put me on this pedestal, and I'm not. I'm not perfect, and I haven't been perfect on that. And we were able to work that out. And I'm not perfect. And as I go through this and work step 10, 11, and 12 on a daily basis, I put those hurts and that pain down. And I keep working on the steps. I keep coming here. I've been serving on the kitchen team at Central. I'm setting up um, the uh, rooms in Cape. It's restored and given me freedom going through these steps. And I'm going through it again, believe me, it's not easy. I still have more onion to peel. I still have more that I have to deal with, lots of hurt and pain. But I'm gonna tell you what this program has done for me. See, my ex-husband that I told you about, for those of you that have heard of many, I found my ex-husband, he was homeless. And God told me I was going to help him, which I did not want to help him because, remember, I had the news crews. I had uh, newspapers in my door. I had death threats. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. But I ended up helping him, finding him a halfway house, also getting him some food, some clothes. Now, of course, he doesn't want anything to do with the kids because um, there's some things going on with him. 
And in regards to my dad, well, I have a better relationship with my dad. I was able to make amends with him. I was able to just realize that, you know what, he's in a lot of pain and hurt. He told me about his past. We've gotten closer. He goes and he talks to me, and every week he tells me he loves me, finally. Something I've always wanted. And then, in, reg in regards to my marriage, we've been married 21 years, or 22. <laughs> It's been a tough ride because the first 15 of it was very hard. But let me tell you something. That last picture that you saw up there, that was him and I at the Sea of Galilee renewing our wedding vows. And because I had been working the steps and because I had been working a freedom program, I was finally able to say to him, I forgive you. I love you, and truly mean it. Not just this, not just lip, but truly mean that I loved him and I forgave him. And I'm telling you, our relationship has just blossomed. We're growing together. This program does work if you work the program. You can't just sit by. You cannot just say, you know what, I'm going to let somebody else do it for me because it's not going to work. We all are broken. And this year, the theme that we have about freedom, oh my gosh, it is total freedom. All I can say is just do it. And don't be in that cage that you've seen Rochelle talk about with Kip in the cage, you know. <laughs> don't be a Kip. <laughs> but get out of your cage and just do it. Thank you. Thank you.